Welcome. And thanks for coming. My name is Joel Smith, and I'm an independent consultant connecting in from Boulder, Colorado. And on behalf of the National Academies Committee to advise the U.S. Global Change Research Program, the USGCRP, I welcome you to this listening session on global change issues with a specific focus on water-related challenges and opportunities. Through USGCRP, federal agencies coordinate climate and global change research and use the results to create tools and assessments to help people make decisions in the context of global changes. Through this session and others in this five-part series, we aim to connect more directly with users and researchers who are building and applying global change information and tools in their work and to gather insights and information that USGCRP can consider as it plans the implementation of its work over the coming decades. In these sessions, we are welcoming staff from the USGCRP and agencies that are part of the USGCRP, members of the National Academies Committee to advise the USGCRP, USGCRP, of which I'm honored to be a member, and all of you, users and researchers who are engaged in building on and applying the types of knowledge and tools that, you see that the USGCRP is charged with developing and supporting. All right, so we can see the agenda slide. Okay, so in today's session, following the introductory remarks by uh, myself and uh, GCRP um, and, 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 and Academy staff and uh, Wayne Higgins from NOAA, um, we have a series of speakers who will provide statements all of whom have expressed interest in contributing when registering for the session. Everyone here will have opportunities to contribute through an engagement platform that we will introduce shortly. Um, now, just note representatives from the USGCRP and the committee to advise the USG, G, USGCRP are attending in listening mode today. So thank you for joining and we look forward to hearing from you over the next 90 minutes till 3.30 Eastern. All right, next slide, please. All right, to start, I'd like to acknowledge that while today we are gathered virtually, the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional land of the Nacotchtank, Anacostan, and Piscataway peoples, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and the nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience, in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. We also acknowledge that our understanding of water and global change issues are closely related to and informed by indigenous knowledge and experience. And that many native communities are on the front line of impacts from these changes. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm joining you from Boulder, Colorado, which is the traditional land of the Arapaho, Cheyenne and Ute peoples. All right, next slide, please. So I and the other members of the committee to advise the USGCRP are very much looking forward to these sessions to connect directly with researchers and users who are using and applying global change information in their work. As part of our regular meetings throughout the year, we provide this and other opportunities to engage with and hear from broad audiences to inform this important work. The goals of this series of listening sessions include gathering useful, actionable input for USGCRP for implementation of its work, making connections and expanding the group of researchers and users who are directly engaging with the USGCRP, recognizing connections across researchers, users, and themes of USGCRP and its products, or USGCRP work and its products, and finally informing potential future engagement mechanisms and opportunities, including forms, approaches, and participants for such engagement. Next slide, please. All right, today we're seeking input on how USGCRP may implement its work to better understand and address global change issues. You do not need to be familiar with the USGCRP to provide input. We're specifically seeking to connect with a broader audience in these sessions. If you are unfamiliar with USGCRP, we hope you had a chance to view the introductory video on our event pages before the session or encourage you to view it after the session. In preparing for these listening sessions, USGCRP requested input and insights on the following themes to inform the development of its strategic priorities and activities. 
First, diversity, equity, and inclusion. What actions should be prioritized to fully incorporate these values in research, community engagement, and workforce development? How do we implement them? Second, advancing science. What are the priority gaps in foundational science and methods that require enhanced long-term investments? Third, use-inspired research. How do we ensure that, the US, that USGCRP science and products are better driven by and connected to users, including, for example, improved use of consultation, collaboration, translation, dissemination, informing climate services, and socioeconomic sciences integration? And socioeconomic sciences integration itself is a point. What are the priorities for integrating socioeconomic sciences into our programs and to inform critical decisions? So particularly helpful feedback might include ideas on emerging large scale scientific questions related to global change and or response, especially those where interagency collaboration will be critical. Specific information on how science is or is not being used to inform societal response to global change and why, and knowledge gaps and obstacles to implementing scientific tools or knowledges. Now, please note the USG, the USGCRP is developing its next decadal strategic plan and expects to release the draft prospectus with public comment opportunity before the end of 2021, that is by the end of next month. Well, while these listening sessions may help inform the development or, or implementation of this plan, individual feedback on the prospectus should be submitted through the public comment mechanism. And I just wanna remind all the speakers that to ensure we have time we're gonna be holding you uh, to a five minute limit. Now, next slide, please. All right, our expectations for conduct. We are committed to fostering a professional, respectful, inclusive environment where all participants can fully, partic all can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on any identified identity-based factors. And please note these specific bullets here, I'm not gonna, read them, but we take these all very seriously. And if there is any misconduct, please report this immediately to Stephen Stichter and his email is right there. And so now I wanna turn it over to Stephen uh, for some uh, other items to cover before we hear from our speakers. Greetings and uh, thank you, Joel, for that introduction and welcome. <clears throat> um, so we, uh, next slide, please. Um, so we have uh, these sessions, as Joel uh, described, are really for to seek input from you on how USGCRP implements and carries its work forward over the coming decade. Um, and for to hear from you, we have a couple of different ways that we're going to be interacting during this session. First of all, anybody who is hearing me has successfully gotten onto Zoom, and so welcome. Um, we uh, we encourage you to change your name um, to change your name to reflect your full name and um, the affiliation or affiliations that you have. So others who may be looking um, in the in the chat. Um, can find you and understand um, where you have the perspective that you are bringing into the room. Um, additionally, we will we are providing live closed captioning of this event, um, so you can find that under the uh, live transcript button within Zoom. If you have any any need for assistance, um, please send a chat to the hosts through the Zoom chat or send an email to Rob Greenaway, my colleague, who will be supporting us on the technical side um, at the email that's listed. Um, next slide, please. So our, our other mode of interaction with you is, so the primary uh, focus of what will be happening in the Zoom window is we have a series of speakers who will be talking about their uh, recommendations and thoughts uh, for you SGCRP. Um, we, we also wanna give everyone who is in this room the opportunity to provide their insights and, and contributions. Um, so I invite you at this point in time to go ahead and um, join our Slido, uh, Slido uh, platform. You can do that either by pointing, if you're using a, um, a mobile device for your interaction, you can point it to this QR code. 
Alternatively, you can go to slido.com and enter this, uh, the code, which is pound sign 881326. And in the chat, there's also a link directly to Slido. Um, we, we, it will first ask you to provide your first and last names. Um, and then once you get into, um, into Slido, we'll be using the Q&A component. Um, we will, I, polls are listed, but we're just gonna be focusing on the Q&A today. Uh, with the Q&A, we're asking the same questions that we're asking the speakers. Or what, are your, what are your insights, recommendations, and, and comments for USGCRP as it, as it moves into this next decade of work on how they do what they do. Um, any comments about future strategic plan inputs should be held for the, um, for the public session that will be open or the public comment period that will be open uh, once that draft strategic plan, plan prospectus has been released. Um, within the Slido session, uh, we will be adding points from the, from the speakers and we ask you to add your points as well. Um, and you also have the opportunity to re add replies to other questions or questions and comments. Even though we're, it's in the question and answer, we encourage you to put statements and recommendations uh, rather than questions. We're not, uh, the USGCRP and the committee are in listening mode, so we won't be specifically answering questions in this session. Finally, in the Slido platform, you can watch, uh, you can order the comments either by the most recent comments that people have put in or popular because that reflects the upvotes that, um, that other particip participants may be giving to, comment, to comments and questions. Um, finally, um, we do ask that you be respectful in all of your engagement uh, on this platform and all of our platforms. Um, next slide, please. Um, we are, as you would have seen at the beginning when you signed on, we are recording this session and we will be making this the re this recording available more broadly. Um, so a note, please note the disclaimer about that recording. And additionally, the inputs that we receive through the Slido platform will be part of the public access record for this event. Um, so comments and, and names of people who provide the comments will be included in that public, rec public record. Um, so please uh, keep that in mind when adding your comments and contributions. Uh, finally, the, we've asked the speakers who are coming today, though they are coming from an organization, we've asked them to speak from their own, from their own perspective. Um, it may well reflect their organizations, um, but that the speakers are coming as, as individuals uh, for their presentations. Um, so thank you, and please, uh, please provide us uh, with rich and, and enthusiastic commentary and engagement throughout this session. Um, with that, um, I would like to invite uh, Wayne Higgins on. Wayne is uh, representing the USGCRP um, in welcoming you into this session. Wayne? Stephen, thank you very much. I really appreciate this opportunity to say hello and thank you. So good afternoon, good morning to our West Coast participants. My name is Wayne Higgins. Um, I am the chair of the Subcommittee on Global Change Research. Now the subcommittee consists of representatives from the 13 agencies that make up the US Global Change Research Program. And as you heard from Joel, we refer to the organization as the US GCRP. So you can think of the subcommittee as the board of directors for US GCRP. So I'm here today representing those 13 agencies that make up USGCRP, and we want you to know that we are very serious about our legislative mandate, which is to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. So on behalf of USGCRP, I really want to say thank you for your interest, for your time, and your expertise. So again, your input will be heard and considered as we draft this new 10-year strategic plan for USGCRP. It will be valid for the period from 2022 to 2031. In addition to staff from the National Academies, um, there are a number of federal agency representatives 
and also USGCRP National Coordination Office staff here today as well. And they will be listening very carefully and taking notes that will inform our discussions and writing this new plan. The new plan as has been mentioned will be uh, completed late next year in 2022. And as Joel mentioned earlier, between now and then you can expect to see a prospectus, the prospectus being a high level outline of the plan and that will come out for public comment in the next month. And you'll also see a full draft of the plan that will be released for public comment and for review by the National Academies in the middle of 2022. So please watch for these opportunities to comment on both the prospectus and the draft plan. And finally, uh, on behalf of the USGCRP, I wanna express our sincere thanks to the staff of the National Academies for organizing these listening sessions and specifically today to Steven Stichter, your host, as well as Amanda Stout and Amanda Purcell. And I also wanna extend my thanks to Katie Reeves and Julie Morris from the USGCRP National Coordination Office for their roles in making this possible today. So again, we look forward to your comments and suggestions and I thank you very much. Back to you, Steve. All right, actually I'll go ahead, thank you. Thanks, Wayne, for those remarks. And uh, now it's our turn to hear from you. So let me just uh, go over the ground rules here to make it fair to everyone to make sure that we uh, have time for all uh, for at least uh, 12 speakers to speak. We're going to um, have some strict time limits. Uh, you each have been allocated three to five minutes to uh, give your remarks. And I will let you know when you have 30 seconds left. That is when you're four minutes and 30 seconds into it. And if need be, and I hope I don't have to do it, I will jump in when you've uh, exceeded your five minutes and uh, get us on to the next speaker. I'm just gonna introduce you by name. Please uh, introduce your uh, institution or your affiliation or background as you wish. So um, let me now first turn to uh, David Bihar. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, David Bihar, I'm the Climate Program Director at the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. It's a Department of the City and County of San Francisco. Um, I also, uh, and so my focus is on climate adaptation. It's gonna be my focus in these remarks. I was the founding chair of the Water Utility Climate Alliance. You'll be hearing from Miranda Cashman, uh, New York City, a little more about WUCA in a minute. I'm also currently chair of the Bay Area Climate Adaptation Network, which is a network of local governments and community-based organizations focused on adaptation in the Bay Area. And finally, I'm. I'm also co-chair of the Sea Level Rise Grand Challenge Committee of the World Climate Research Program, which is focused on understanding what science we need to um, work on the resilience of coastal communities around the uh, planet. Um, there's a theme that I've noticed in this work among science entities who lead research regarding the impacts of climate change, like the, like the GCRP, your uh, strategic plan. Uh, about to be updated. Goal two says we should inform or you should inform decisions and provide the scientific basis to inform and enable timely decisions on adaptation and mitigation. The American Geophysical Union strategic plan calls for moving science from quote usable to used. And finally, the WCRP strategic plan sets a goal of bridging climate science and society. So linking climate science to societal needs, particularly regarding the need to adapt is a top of mind theme for those science entities out there. And we appreciate that and that's very important. Very quickly, I'm gonna review the uh, input on advancing science that was requested. Uh, I think, and, and I'm gonna go through these really quickly because I don't think this is the most important part of what I'm, I'm gonna talk about. But in terms of the science, the hard science itself, we need better work on high, high end sea level rise. Past work has been a little bit problematic in that area. Um, and that's a very important, component of adaptation to sea level rise. Uh, Long-term precipitation trends in the Southwest are poorly understood. Extreme storms are incre increasingly top of mind, both on the East and West coasts. We need a better understanding of meteorological drought in the future, its intensity, its duration, its frequency, et cetera. Hydrologic modeling under low flow conditions is particularly challenging. We need a little bit of research on that. And then finally on emissions, we need to ensure robust treatment of the pathway that we're on today as a planet, which is 2.7 degrees centigrade in the year 2100. It's not adequate anymore to present RCP 2.6 and RCP 8.5, which are two of the least likely outcomes that we should expect 
to be living in over the next 100 years. In terms of feedback on use-inspired research, I think more important than the substantive science issues I just mentioned, which I think we're all aware of, is the process of discerning exactly what decision makers need for our decision making processes. You need to meet decision makers where they live to provide actionable information for assessing vulnerability, for educating our publics, and then finally, when it comes time, to implementing adaptation action, which will be both expensive and difficult politically, sociologically, economically. This means engaging with adaptation practitioners in the production of actionable science. In particular, create connectivity with communities outside the federal government. I often talk about the top agencies in the federal government like that are operations oriented like uh, Bureau of Reclamation as you know, when they get information from federal science entities, it's a little bit like the rich getting richer. Think about those entities like us that are much less resourced that really need actionable information and engage with those communities outside the federal government. This means doing the hard work of co-production, working with us to understand our questions before initiating at least some of your science. Invest in, and so that, that co-production conversation is the, is the thing that everyone talks about, but it's difficult. It's more difficult than research in some ways and it's time consuming, but that's the investment we'd like to see USGCRP collectively and the agencies that make up the GCRP uh, individually to invest in. Need to expand the provision of climate translation and climate services that needs to scale up to meet the need that's growing. You know how to do that. You have the RESA program in NOAA. We have the Climate um, Adaptation Science Centers in USGS, which feature people and data both. They've demonstrated that professional engagement with practitioners can work and be successful but now we need to scale that up. We need greater investment. In other words, the, the, the need is not so much for product as for process. And so, so to David, conclude- David, we have a few seconds left. Got it. Engagement, yep. co-production, climate services are not in and of themselves research. We know that, but they're investments that lead to research that meets the needs of an increasing number of communities that are trying to understand how to adapt to the challenge of climate change, which is the 21st century challenge. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, David. Right on time. All right, I'd like to now call on uh, Lucia Rodriguez. Hello. Can you? I hope you can hear me well. Uh, yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you so much for this opportunity. It's an honor to talk today. Uh, and um, David Behar brought very, very important points. But today I want to give a couple points of concern that sometimes they are left out of the discussion, especially in regard to water use issues. While water scarcity has to be a critical component of our research efforts, um, I think that we should also focus on water quality and how our changing climate will affect our water sources. And of course, who or which communities will be greater affected by this. There are two major points I would like to discuss regarding water quality and our clim climate crisis, both related to an increase in the frequency and magnitude of our of drought and flooding events and how climate change will affect our water, uh, water sources. The first one is something that we have already experienced and we are experien experiencing more often. I'm an assistant professor in the New Jersey Institute of Technology in New Jersey. And even in the storm uh, with, uh, with Ida Florian here, a community just next to, to me, they had um, a boil water advisory for four weeks following the storm. So this, um, um, this increase flooding events and following by drought will affect the operation of our water and with water treatment plants and our already aging infrastructure. We have already experienced also in New Jersey a lead uh, crisis in drinking water, uh, in part as a, the result of our changing water sources, decreasing the pH, dilution of corrosion control, and also as a conse consequence of um, century old water distribution systems. 
This has already also been seen in other parts of the US. We change the water quality of our drinking water sources. We change the effectiveness of our corrosion control. We are now replacing our lead service lines, but still there are several sources of lead still in our houses. And it is critical that we understand how changes in the feed water quality will affect lead mobilization. Further, as I mentioned already, flooding events will affect the capacity of treatment of our water and wastewater treatment plants and our distribution systems. We also live in an area where we have, um, where we have combined sewer systems. So we cannot continue to retrofit our, our utilities, but rather invest in improving them. Finally, I will also mention how climate change, extensive drought events and flooding will affect the contaminants in already impacted lands, like superfund sites. We expect climate change to drive an increase in, uh, in temperature, decrease in pH, salinity, uh, ionic strength that will affect our ecological diversity and microbial populations. This will affect the biochemical reactions that control the equilibrium of some of these contaminants in these affected lands. And it has already been shown that changes in redox conditions um, going from drought to flooding events will affect the mobility and increase the mobility of these contaminants. How can we prevent this from happening when it's already happening? Finally, and just in the last minute, I want to mention that obviously this concern will greatly affect already impacted communities that have already suffered of environmental justice issues, legacy contamination that is still recovering from a pandemic. Uh, they have job and food insecurities, and they should be the priority, the foremost of our efforts. Um, there's a few studies that have shown that and the represented communities have less trust in our drinking water systems, but these studies have also failed to study what is the source of the water, where is the water coming from, and what are other factors that might, might be affecting this trust. Uh, so with that, I want to thank you, and I will take, if you want, I will be happy to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rodriguez. I'd like to next call on uh, Miranda Cashman. Hello, thank you so much. Um, sorry, let me just get everything in place. Thank you, all right. Um, first, let me say thank you so much for allowing me to share in this forum. My name is Miranda Cashman. I'm a project manager at the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And today I'm actually here somewhat on behalf of the Water Utility Climate Alliance, or WUCA, which David Bihar mentioned earlier um, in his comments. So just to give you a little bit more background on WUCA itself, because we think WUCA could be a great collaborator in going forward with federal agencies. Um, the Water Utility Climate Alliance was founded in 2007 between 12 of the nation's large, largest water providers. And WUCA's mission is to collaboratively advance water utility climate change adaptation. And the role that WUCA plays has been critical and you know, vital for New York City DEP for identifying commonalities across the water sector. Um, and if you want to learn more about WUCA um, or look at any of our products, such as the Leading Practices in Climate Adaptation Guide, which has gotten a lot of press recently, you can go to our website, wucaonline.org, which is w-u-c-a online.org. Um, so I'm, I'm here kind of on behalf of them, um, but these are also my own thoughts um, to contribute to this forum. We as water sector practitioners, uh, practitioners could really benefit from more active collaboration. And this really just strengthens what David Bihar um, said in his comments. Um, one of the main challenges we face is turning scientific knowledge into actionable science. And many times we're given these like prolific scientific conclusions that actually end up having somewhat limited use in adaptation planning for water utilities. And we need some more support from federal agencies to develop research from the beginning that directly advances decision making and planning for critical water infrastructure infrastructure. So one suggestion is to bring water utilities like WUCA or utilities themselves into the research process early on because we could communicate the challenges and research questions that we are interested in and what our user needs are. And we really do want to play a more active role in this early stage when research ideas are developed. Um, 
an example of this um, is uh, New York City DEP um, is a stormwater uh, utility as well. And so we face urban flooding challenges. Um, so, you know, Hurricane Ida has already been mentioned. And in the context of Hurricane Ida and urban flooding, we need some more data and guidance about precipitation intensity both historical surveys and high resolution precipitation intensity projections, which we completely recognize is hard to do. You know, there are limitations to uh, methodology, there's scientific uncertainty, but we think that the more dialogue between the utilities and the climate science community is absolutely vital um, to making, you know, better decisions for the infrastructure that we, we manage. Um, Another point, kind of shifting gears into equity, um, I'd like to include some comments from another WUCA member, um, Anne Grodnick Nagel, who is the climate policy advisor at Seattle Public Utilities. And Anne had some ideas about how the water sector can better address equity challenges. Um, first, creating targeted workforce development and contractor support for blue green jobs at and with water utilities. Second, expanding partnerships with BIPOC-led community-based organizations to build capacity and improve outcomes from utility projects. And this once again highlights the importance of open communication pathways in all areas of the water sector and at all stages of adaptation. Um, Third, prioritizing water infrastructure projects and programs designed to generate multiple benefits for communities. For example, this could be stormwater management improvements and open space jobs and community connectivity. And this type of multi-benefit approach has been shown to be extremely beneficial. Um, WUCA has actually done a lot of work in that area. Um, but, you know, tying all of these kind of suggestions together, it's really critical for us to have support from federal partners to prioritize goals such as these um, and building momentum in the, the equity space. Um, so thanks to Anne for contributing some of those ideas. Um, I kind of raced through a lot of the points I had, but just to close out, um, we at WUCA, we strive to break down silos, right? WUCA work has shown that there are broad questions and themes that are shared by many in the water sector, even if actual implementation is very community and neighborhood specific. There are these broad themes that are common among us. The diversity of the utilities within WUCA does end up strengthening our coalition and gives us a unique perspective. And so we think that expanding this, these early in the process collaborations between utilities, federal partners, the scientific community, and even local neighborhood communities will strengthen the water sector and give us a holistic and inclusive path forward to protecting critical infrastructure. So thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to just turn the floor to Stephen for a brief reminder to folks. Um, yes, I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have a, a platform with Slido. You can find the link to join Slido in the chat. And um, I'm gathering some of the comments from, from speakers and adding them to that, but we're looking for everybody to contribute and make comments on, on the ideas and, and recommendations and considerations. Um, in that platform as well. So um, thank you. And um, for the speakers, um, I welcome you all also going into the platform and entering comments um, that relate to your oral contributions. All right, Joel, continue. All right, thanks. You. Thanks. To, and also, yeah, to the speakers too, if you don't mind, please in the chat, summarize your key points, say uh, about three or so, but that, that will help us all in in taking notes, making sure we're highlighting what, what is important to you. And now let me call on uh, uh, Meghna Babar Sebens. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but That's right. is yours, yeah. Meghna? Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, my, so my name is Meghna Babar Sebens, and good morning, everyone, and good afternoon for those on the East Coast. Um, so I'm an associate professor here at Oregon State University, and um, Today, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the research that I do and how it relates to some of the issues we're dealing with in the USGCRP efforts. So a lot of the work that I work with my colleagues is related to trying to do more participatory planning uh, to help communities, especially rural communities, work on exploring ways to manage their water systems, whether it's water resources or water infrastructure, to try and plan for adaptation to climate change. And one of the things that we um, often face when engaging with our stakeholders is 
well, what can I do or what can we do as a community when we, when we don't have enough resources or we don't have enough technical expertise? And so what we've learned over time is that planning for adaptation to climate change can be very overwhelming for communities, especially small communities that have limited resources. And so uh, folks have to think about how, do they, how are they going to coordinate these planning efforts across different levels of governments, whether or public private sectors, or even individuals and households, and there are plenty of barriers that usually stand in their way. Um, and then the gap from the knowledge that is a research that we're doing as researchers to action for both planning activities or implementing solutions or adaptation actions still continues to remain wide. So the potential solution that I wanted, I think could be really helpful in uh, helping researchers and also practitioners in this area of engaging stakeholders in planning for adaptation. I think is storytelling. And so I, I think it would be really helpful just based on our experience that if uh, there were ways where USGCRP could create products or multiple mechanisms for uh, documenting, telling and disseminating uh, diverse knowledge to action stories uh, in small communities or big communities that can be understood by non-technical persons and also showcase how communities can use the different USGCRP products to first of all initiate, how do you even get started on planning efforts in a community that is so small? Um, maybe I need to partner with other communities on that effort and then coordinate our planning efforts as well as maintain these planning efforts, both at multiple levels when it comes to say, you know, efforts that are uh, focused on the public sector or private sector or governmental or even household and individual actions, right? Uh, so how do you sort of maintain those planning efforts over time at multiple levels? Um, and storytelling can be a really powerful approach that I think USGCRP and other groups can use to identify and as well as disseminate examples of communities where the public, as well as the local state or federal or even tribal and private decision makers may have collaborated in the past or are beginning to collaborate or are continuing to collaborate in different ways and multiple levels um, so that they can sort of create multiple adaptive water management strategies using these products. Um, some of the other core benefits that I think storytelling can also help communities um, is to help public as well as other stakeholders in these communities um, highlight some of the synergies in the actions that, that if they are taken at multiple levels, whether it's governmental or individual household level, how together they can help prepare the regions of these multiple communities to successfully manage the diverse risks to their water systems, whether it's you know, wildfires or drought or a combination of risks, um, as well as these stories can help them identify what kinds of gaps or trade-offs or conflicts that they may run into uh, in their own communities um, and that may require uh, new or additional technological or societal investments. Or they may in fact have to change maybe laws and policies or changes to how we uh, manage water in the current uh, world using very siloed water organization and institutions. So are there ways to create new efforts where we can sort of break down those silos um, as well as resolve barriers that may exist to equitable, just and culturally sensitive adaptation. Um, and then the other benefit I think the storytelling can really help is to sort of also help educate communities that, hey, this is not a perfect process. You know, adaptation process is not perfect. We have to try, we have to learn from our mistakes or learn from our successes and then change our actions for improving resilience over time. So it's important to, for folks to understand when they look at these stories that certain risks and vulnerabilities may still remain in their community, especially if there are systemic pressures against change. So um, overall, the summary of my message is that, you know, these storytelling can really help communities learn from each other. And I think there needs to be a much more better investment in how we develop, document, and share these stories in uh, communities that may use these USGCRP products. That's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. I'm impressed. All our speakers have timed time their remarks uh, quite impressively. All right. I'd next like to call on uh, Anna Carolina Moran. Again, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. <laughs> no worry. Thank you. Can, you. can you hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. I summarize my points as we requested there in the chat. And um, I'm Carolina Moran. I am the resiliency officer for South Florida Water Management District. And uh, I just want to emphasize uh, three points here. And um, I will be uh, reiterating a lot of what um, Mr. Berahar and also um, um, some other uh, speakers already emphasized here today. 
So my first point is related to decision-making support. Um, how can we get access to information that would better inform our programs, um, especially under deep uncertainty? We have advanced um, hydrologic and hydraulic modeling efforts uh, going on in our agency, and it's extremely important that we um, understand the climate projections, the boundaries, how we should be um, evaluating this range of uncertainty in some of the variables that we are dealing with, and also the need to take into account those factors in a joint probabilistic um, approach. So that's number one, like having the tools and, and better information that we can really inform our age and age models. Uh, my point two is related to that, but I more specifically dealing with the need for advanced regional climate projections, um, including but not limited to sea level rise, rainfall, evapotranspiration, um, and this would happen through increased resolution in global climate model results that are able to capture local and regional um, influencing factors and really climate processes that um, have a uh, huge interference in the way we are reading those results. Um, we have one example of a recent product that we have been developing with the USGS for the past year on determining future extreme rainfall. Uh, events and um, we evaluated three different uh, downscaling products and um, we have still, I would say, a relatively large uh, uncertainty range in the way we look at that for uh, anticipating future rainfall. And um, I think there is need for us to be able to have additional tools that would guide us on how can we get a, I would say, a better, a, a more consensus on how we read that and utilize those products in our efforts. And then we also have, um, I have a third point here. I might have some background noise, I apologize. But uh, so my third point is how can we access resources and tools to review, um, validate, and maybe enhance our um, efforts, our local efforts. We have two uh, efforts going on in our agency now. First one, we are looking at data uh, that we monitor. So our agency has a very large monitoring program and we are trying to evaluate trends in uh, correlation between those data sets to see if they relate somehow to some of the climate signals and, and really determining influencing factors. Uh, so it would be really helpful if we had tools and efforts that to, to really inform what we are doing here. And uh, we are gonna be proposing the development of a regional climate model to determine future extreme rainfall as well as part of our efforts. And again, um, we appreciate the opportunity to collaborate and uh, exchange information and knowledge in, in this area here. So um, to end up my points, um, I, I think, again, reiterating a lot of what was said here already, more dialogue, better collaboration and, and co-production, I believe are the three main points. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to provide the comments here today. Thank you. I kind of appreciate you uh, spotting us some time. Is anything, you, there's another minute if you'd like to add anything else, but otherwise we can move ahead. Don't okay. worry, those were my points. Thank you. All right, very good. So I apologize, there may be some uh, confusion about the order. We will get to everybody. I assure everybody who's on that we'll get to all of you. Uh, let me call on Kate Brauman next. Are you ready, Kate? Yes. All right, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kate Brauman. I am with the University of Alabama at the new Global Water Security Center. We are a DOD funded center um, here in Alabama. and. The goal of this center is very much about taking data and water data um, into use, particularly for the security community. Um, and I think this is important, not just for security, but more broadly as USGCRP thinks about um, investing in future science. And one of the things that we're really seeing is that um, it's not just about being responsive to user needs, but really working with users to understand their questions. And this is something that's come up in earlier points, but something that we found is really critical. Um, there's a need to invest in actually helping users understand what it is they need to know in order to adapt to a changing water future. Um, another piece of what we've seen that's important that I, I hope that, that everyone's able to think about is that it's often not actually increased precision that's the most important thing and the thing that we need to invest in the most. Um, we're often not answering what are really the right questions, um, particularly the ones that link climate impacts and changing climate and water impacts to human and biophysical um, 
impacts there. And so um, making that linkage across the biophysical and social sciences is something we're excited to see more of. Um, and finally, I, I'd like to urge more emphasis on some of the day-to-day -day technical products that are already in use, but could be updated to reflect changing climate and changing water futures. Um, you would be shocked at how often I talk to state and local folks who are trying to do water management and all they want is to see Atlas 14 updated with new climate data. And I think these kinds of everyday workaday project products are some of the most important ways we can get new climate science out to folks who are really going to use it and for whom it's really important for adaptation. And I want to reiterate my thanks for um, having the chance to speak here and really all of the, the comments that have come before. I think most of what I'm saying is not different than that. And so I will end now. Thank you so much. I muted myself. Sorry, Kate. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. I would now like to uh, call on um, Ali Bahadur. Ali, are you there? Let's see, is, if Ali's not there, uh, let me then next, and we can come back to you, Ali, if you if you come online. Peg Fershong? Is Peg there? All right, um, we'll come, I'll come back at the end and we'll circle back and see. Maura Allaire? All right, <laughs> keep going through the list here. Um, Ryan Hollins. I'm here, thank you. All right, good, your Sorry, floor is yours. Great, um, <laughs> thank, right, thank you, you for the opportunity uh, to provide comment today uh, as a private citizen, a geographer and computer scientist working in the climate space. Um, my work focuses on several aspects of water quality um, and the impacting of a changing climate on our water infrastructure. Um, so the approach my team and I take is, is sort of a systems, a systems engineering perspective. Um, and given the, the breadth of the topic uh, here, I'm going to focus my comments on the two themes of advancing science and use inspired research. Um, given the, the rapid population growth we're seeing and a changing climate, uh, we're seeing additional stresses put on the availability and the distribution um, of water resources across the globe. Um, and we've seen uh, huge impacts to both water quality and to water infrastructure like water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants. Um, so I'd argue that we need um, mature scalable technologies for continuous monitoring uh, of water contaminants in our waterways and also monitoring of water use as that changes given um, decreasing water resources in the West, um, increased water resources elsewhere. Um, in addition to researching and evaluating these scalable approaches um, like remote sensing and imagery analysis for water use, um, we also need research and development um, around new materials that can both detect or sense chemical contaminants and remediate these contaminants. Um, in combination with traditional means of, means of sampling, um, new technologies need to be developed for low cost real time sensing. Um, for contaminants such as uh, perfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS or dioxin um, and broad scale application of these technologies um, can really help to screen for these chemicals and both um, understand how extreme weather events are changing the distribution and movement of chemical contaminants and how our water infrastructure is being impacted by new emerging contaminants. Um, on the water infrastructure angle here, uh, we think we need more research and development on sensor technologies to um, make our water treatment plants and wastewater treatment plants more resilient to these environmental threats. Um, in addition to looking at how we can uh, implement water infrastructure with actuators to enable sort of real time um, resilience and, and um, increase the resilience of our stormwater management systems. Uh, this, of course, comes with, with certain risks. Um, in a more connected, smart water system, there's more risks for, um, for attacks and, and cyber vulnerabilities. 
Um, so also looking at the, uh, the trade-offs and the risks and implementing some of this smart infrastructure we think is important. Um, to kind of shift focus, another area of, of concern here would be water use and emerging technologies to reuse water. Um, so while there's been a lot of academic research on, uh, for instance, antibiotics in water, um, antibiotic metabolites and, and genes um, detected in surface water, we don't yet have a systematic, systematic way to detect or monitor for these uh, chemicals or the presence of gene, genes in, in water effluent um, and surface waters. Um, so this is an increasing and significant problem. And, and we think that additional research in looking at um, monitoring for these contaminants um, in situ or even remotely would, would help us um, as these events uh, increase in, in frequency and duration. Um, you know, robust data on chemical contamination writ large is really needed across the country, um, including data on the area sampled, historic measurements, the geophysical conditions, um, all of that data, if shared, can help understand what remediation technologies are available to water utilities, to communities. Um, and we can really learn from both the lessons learned and the, the mistakes and the, the successes across um, different states. Um, with that, I wanna thank you for your time. Um, I've really appreciated the comments from the other panelists and, um, and really would love um, to have a further discussion and for you to consider some of these critical areas of research and development. Thanks. Thank you very much. So um, we actually have done uh, pretty well in this and, and our speakers have been very timely. And in addition, there are some people who were, were signed up and I'm, I'm gonna just double, forget, well, everybody bear with me. I'm just gonna read some names here and just see if you're online. Um, and I'm gonna read your name and give you a second, unmute yourself. Let let me know if you're, if you're here and able to offer remarks. So Nicholas Flocken, Yes, I'm here. You are here. All right. Uh, the floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you. I thought you're going to go through a list. I unmuted myself and went back to it. Thank you. Um, so, well, thank you for the National Academies and to the US GCRP for, uh, for hosting this listening session and collecting input from the public. My name is Nick Flocken. I recently left NOAA, where I was a policy advisor to the NOAA administrator. Uh, so, so, Wayne, it's actually good to see you again. Uh, however, today I'm here on behalf of uh, one of my clients, Tomorrow IO, um, and my clients, my comments today are focused on the topics advancing science and using inspired research. In short, my suggestion, uh, suggested answer to both these questions is to encourage engagement with the private sector. Uh, while this is not a novel idea, I would still encourage this body and many of the attendees here could benefit from this as well. Uh, to reinvigorate that effort, especially in developing decadal and global change research plans. All of the agencies represented here through the USGCRP are, are working hard to advance climate and weather observations, modeling, and predictions. In fact, many of the USGCRP agencies like NOAA, NASA, NSF, all ones that I work directly with uh, over the last couple of years, have great relationships with each other uh, and in many ways depend on each other for the researched operations to research ecosystem. However, that's only part of the picture. The private sector can invest more money faster in research and development than government and, mark and the market forces that drive the necessary efficiency to move from research to commercial viability is something agencies just cannot experience. Thankfully, there's been several leaders in government over the last de couple decades uh, who recognize the importance of partnerships beyond federal agencies. Programs like the Commercial Weather Data Pilot uh, provide opportunity for private companies to build trust with federal agencies while advancing federal research and operations. Uh, NOAA, NASA, and even the Air Force have each benefited from those types of pilot programs. So the questions, uh, what are the priority gaps that require enhanced long-term investment and how to ensure US GCRP uses inspired research? My answer, like I said at the top, is simple. Look at the private sector. There's countless innovators developing novel technologies and sensing techniques that can fill gaps in scientific research. In many ways, the private sector is going to be who finds those gaps first. For example, Tomorrow IO is launching the only known satellite constellation equipped with precipitation radar, operational constellation satellite. 
Uh, why does that matter? The topic of this conversation today is water. Look at the success of TRM, GPM, and RainCube. All of those single satellite radar systems with a low revisit rate showed the importance of precipitation radar for research, but they did not provide the coverage to be operational. National academies and US GCRP agencies don't need to develop this capacity. It already exists. The National Academy sh should be creative and all the agencies and organizations represented here should be creative in finding mutually beneficial ways to partner with private companies. When executed well, NAS would gain, gain access to proprietary unique data sets with the potential to significantly improve research at a global scale. And private sector companies gain the opportunity to build public trust and prove their data matters. With that, I conclude. Thank you very much for your time and consideration. Appreciate being part of the group today. Well, thank you very much. And, and, and again, apologies uh, where uh, some of the folks we thought would might join in or not. And I, I want to give a chance that there are some others on our list. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna, I have three names showing up here. I'm going to read your names and give you a moment to just, uh, if you're online, just to let me know if you are. Um, so uh, Patricio Ibarra Munizaga. Patricio, are you here? All right, if, if you missed it, don't, I may come back to you. Uh, James uh, Do, Dobro, Dobrowolski, sorry, I'm mangling your name. Or, and the final one I have is Sissy Ma. Okay, let me just see then, is there, um, are there any other, uh, is there anyone else online that would like to offer remarks or let me just offer that first. Let me also offer for the speakers who've already gone, if you would like to clarify something or respond to something you heard another speaker say, I'd say just go ahead and unmute your mic and, and uh, let me know. I'll just take notes. Does any do any other speakers who went wish to go? You'll excuse me one second. Um, if Mr. Uh, Dobrolowski and Mr. Patricio can hear me. I'm going to promote you so that you can um, talk. So we may we will not be able to see you on video, but you'll be able to see that timer for five minutes. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay, super. So um, let me just. Uh, okay, Mr. I Ibarra Mun Munizaga, is it? I'm going to have you go first when you're promoted. Okay, they both are now allowed to talk. They should be able to speak. Okay, Patricio. All right, how about uh, uh, James Dob Dobrowolski? <laughs> are you there? Yeah, hi there, this is Jim Dobrowolski. <laughs> All right, sorry for mangling your name, Jim. <laughs> That's okay, Thanks for it's good. Me. The, floor is, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I am a national program leader in water, and uh, I work for the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture, and we are a, a small agency with a big budget. We fund um, a lot of competitive research. We also support the land-grant institutions um, with uh, not only um, risk-based research and long-term research, but also ex extension and outreach and education. And uh, we have a very active uh, water program. We have been uh, active in my time, which has been 15 years with the agency, looking at um, water quality and quantity effects uh, influenced by climate change. Um, and um, and we'll, we will continue to do that. Uh, we are um, about uh, a $1.7 billion agency. The, uh, the water uh, part of our portfolio uh, right now is focused on uh, a uh, program called Water Quantity and Quality. Uh, it also is picked up in some climate change related uh, programs that are available to, um, to universities and others, laboratories and what have you. Um, and uh, we have uh, 
developed a synthesis of a lot of the work that we did in the last uh, 13 to 14 years. Um, and uh, we are still um, pretty far behind in the information concerning climate change and uh, both water quality and quantity under that large umbrella. And so we're looking forward to folks um, providing us with uh, proposals to that effect. Um, we are uh, obviously focused on reducing the water food agriculture by 50% in some cases, and also increasing the productivity at the same time. And so we're looking for folks to provide us with some technologies that allow us to reduce the, um, the fresh water that agriculture um, now manages across the country, which is about 70 to 80%. Uh, and replacing some of that with traditional water sources, such as recycled water, brackish groundwater, um, treated agricultural return flow, mm -hmm. produced water from, from mining. And so, you know, we'll, we'll be looking forward to folks providing us with proposals toward that end. Um, we're also very interested in how um, constituents of chemical uh, of concern are impacting, or have the potential to impact crops that are grown fresh that might be irrigated with recycled water or waste water that is treated. So we're also looking at those issues. And all of this is focused on trying to uh, alleviate the effects of and to adapt to climate change uh, because obviously, uh, you know, water is going to is one of the biggest issues in, in climate change, and um, and in the future we're going to have a lot more competition for water, but we're still going to have to have irrigated agriculture as our way of increasing the productivity into the future. So we look forward to your um, proposals to you as the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate it. Um, all right, uh, Patricio Ibarra Mon Monazago. I'm sorry, I'm mangling your name too. Are you there? Or, okay, um, how about Sissy Ma? Yes, I'm here. All right, you will be our final speaker. You just made it in. Okay. As the gates are closing. So all the floor is yours, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Sissy Ma from EPA, Office of Research and Development. Um, I'm also the, the co-lead for chapter four for the IPCC, the, uh, the report coming up next year. Um, and also in the, um, the task force uh, with Water Federation Environment. Um, with the task force of inter uh, integrated planning task force. So a lot of our work is involving in the integrated management of water systems or any systems, but particularly today, the topic is water. So when we talk about water under the climate change um, impact, we need to consider water energy nutrient nexus. So water energy is closely related and how can we adapt water system under climate change um, effects? So a lot of the uh, call is for transformative paradigm change. Um, the system we have right now, the wastewater treatment plant, drinking water treatment plant, are we doing the best? Um, treatment plant deliver drinking water, um, wastewater treatment is not cheap. Um, a lot of energy is used in the, in the system. Um, can we make that system more efficient and energy recover from the, the water system from the wastewater and, and water reuse don't have to deliver long distance of water. So this kind of things, uh, how to evaluate water system under this kind of uh, climate change impact. And at the same time, adaptation mitigation and not causing more environment, uh, uh, the, the climate change impact, like right? emitting more global warming gases while solving the water problem. So um, 
this is a good, great opportunity. And um, hopefully US GCRP can invest in the, the transformative or the paradigm shift kind of approach and to have you know, more sustainable water systems in the future. So thanks, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ma. Appreciate it. Um, David Bihar, I understand, would like to uh, uh, offer an additional comment. David, if you don't mind, can you do that? So within about 60 seconds. Yes, no problem. You invited it, so I'll, I'll bring it. And that is the listening session is very valuable. Um, but I would also invite consideration on the part of the panel, the National Academies panel, to have a conversation uh, with folks like the Water Utility Climate Alliance and others who might want to assist in um, probably brainstorming approaches to co-production and user inspired, uh, generating user inspired science with the participation of users uh, as, as part of your reporting process. Um, uh, Miranda Cashman from New York City DEP mentioned that Water Utility Climate Alliance would be a candidate for that. There are many others as well, of course, and if there's a way to kind of envision how that can happen successfully with USGCRP as a kind of conglomerating entity of federal science, uh, I think that'd be a really powerful part of the report um, and recommendations that you're making, as well as potentially, well, I don't know, I guess it's too late for the uh, strategic plan, but if for implementation of the new strategic plan. Thanks, Joel. All right, thank you, David, appreciate it. All right, um, can just, Get my video on here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. That was uh, that was just great. I mean, they were just really a lot of thoughtful comments. Uh, I'm not going to try to summarize them. That would not do them justice. And in fact, I, I'll be honest. I think in managing this, I do want to go back and actually uh, see watch the recording because there was a lot here and see the notes that were taken. But I really appreciate this. I appreciate everybody taking your time. Also appreciate you uh, working with us as we as I realize we took a few of you out of order. And thanks for your patience with that. Um, and, uh, you know, just say this is a great, this is the first of our five sessions. And I, I have to say, I think this is off to a very productive, very helpful start. So with that, I want to thank all of you for being here. And I want to turn it over to uh, Stephen to discuss some final points and next steps. So thank you very much. Great. Um, thank you, Joel, uh, for walking us through all of that and for all of the presenters and contributors um, in today's session. So um, Nikki, can you bring on this, the remaining slides? Um, so next steps. Um, so first of all, I, I do wanna in follow up to what um, David, just David's comments just now, we will not actually be producing a report out of this, um, this series of sessions. Uh, what we're trying to do in having these as a pilot, and this is a pilot effort that we're, that we're undertaking here, is to identify new ways that we can have and additional ways that we can have engagement and input um, into USGCRP in the process. So there are some existing mechanisms that are going to continue. The, uh, certainly the products of, um, that USGCRP is producing, and then also the formal advice that the committee is giving to USGCRP through things such as our um, the recent report that we produced um, this the committee produced earlier this year, um, and so this is an additional input to all of this work um, and a pilot as well. So we're learning we're learning as we're getting the input from you. Um, so while there will not be a formal report coming out of this process itself, um, the inputs that um, that you are giving are being heard by USGCRP staff um, and agencies that are involved with USGCRP as well as the committee. So it will, it will be part of the inputs that they are taking into the next steps. Um, additionally, um, before the end of the year, USGCRP will be providing a uh, draft prospectus on their strategic plan and there will be an opportunity for a formal uh, public comment period on that strategic plan. Next steps following up on today's session um, is that everybody who registered for this session will uh, receive a follow-up link uh, or email with links. And I appreciate 
um, you following up and providing additional insights, both on a questionnaire that provides another opportunity to provide input to USGCRP, um, as well as an evaluation to help us understand how to make these, these pilots turn into a more sustainable uh, input mechanism. Um, we will also be posting the video and uh, the transcript of the sessions to the event page for this event. And the easiest way to get there is to um, look for, you go to the National Academies and search for USGCRP um, or look on the um, board on atmospheric science and, and climate um, events for the link at the bottom of the page. Um, and um, finally, um, this is, and one, if you can go to the next slide, um, this is the first of five sessions. Uh, the sessions will be structured in a similar way, um, but each of the sessions will have a different primary theme to what we, the inputs that we are seeking around global change. Um, so we encourage you to participate in any and all of these sessions. Um, and to please help us spread the word on these sessions. Um, so thank you for joining us today and we hope to see you in, uh, in future sessions as well.